Phil Mason Show. Phil Mason Show is on. Is on in five, in five, four, four, three, three, two, two, one, one. Welcome to the Phil Mason Show. I'm happy to have you here. We're going to spend the entire hour talking NBA basketball tonight. Zeb Benbrook and I will talk, first and foremost, Golden State Warrior Hoop. But we're going to talk a little bit about Mount Rushmore and LeBron James, Kevin Durant, and the whole Who Belongs on Mount Rushmore debate, followed by J.A. Sherman and I will be talking Oklahoma City Thunder Hoops. Up first, from PoundingTheRock.com to talk a little San Antonio Spurs Hoops. Please welcome J.R. Wilco to the show. J.R., how you doing, man? Welcome to the show. Doing great, sir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's always my pleasure to have you here. I got to tell you, um, I, when I was over at the site the other day, PoundingTheRock.com, I saw an article called Beware of Made-Up Trade Rumors. <laughs> and it was an yes. interesting piece. And it's uh, actually, it was a, kind of a spinoff from a posting over at one of those ESPN True Hoop sites that is affiliated with the Oklahoma City Thunder, or they root for them. But beware of made-up trade rumors, and boy, oh boy, there are a lot of them. You know, I can tell you a funny story before we begin. Go for it. When I was doing the show, when I first started, I was doing the show, as you know, maybe a lot of people who are listening don't know, but the first three years, I guess, I did it by myself. And I got on the radio alone, and it was weird. But anyhow, one night I was, I just finished tennis, and the New York Mets had lost again. And I was ticked off, and I had to talk about the Mets. And I used to just open up the computer and just do my thing, you know, because I'm flying solo, like a morning show type deal. Yeah. Anyway, I started, I went on and on about what I would do to fix this team, who I would trade. And where I would trade them to and who I would trade them for. And I had been thinking about it while I was on the tennis court the entire day. Anyhow, I titled the, the uh, show pretty provocatively. Mm-hmm. And the next morning I got up, it was a Sunday. When I, I was, just, yeah, I published it on Friday. So I guess it was Saturday, Sunday morning here, I suppose. There was a, a note from the New York Post. And they wanted to know. <laughs> what my sources were for the trades. And I said, did you listen to the show? And they said, no, we didn't. I said, well, if you did, you'd know that I was speculating and pretending to be general manager. And I made that very clear. And he, and he wrote back and said, whoosh, because we almost ran with that. (laughs) So, I mean, it's easy to do. And this is basically what this article is about, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the whole thing, about this time of year is that the the trade deadline is coming so there's only so much longer that you're going to be able to post anything about trades and trades generate so much discussion they generate so much traffic on the sites and and traffic is it's like nielsen ratings for blogs you know that's that's the way that that uh it's the way that the bills get paid, and so it's it's hard to to sit there and not post anything trade related when everyone else is. And you know, I I I'm the editor in chief of Pounding the Rock. It's 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 my job to to grow the site. I I I have a ple- It's a pleasure. I have a blast doing it. But I I I just can't uh, I just can't do a post on Spurs trades. Simply because everybody else is talking about, you know, what what uh, what players they're about to sign or the rumors that are going out there, I just can't generate that kind of stuff. And uh, so Jay Gomez is is one of the excellent writers on the site, and he he uh, he came up with this idea on his own to to essentially talk about just being careful uh, about not falling for. Um, every single trade rumor that comes down the pike to actually look into it who who where it where it originated who the source is are they reliable and what the details are and and even 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 a page even a post here on the on on the blog about being careful about not 
getting carried away went crazy on the site. It just was the one of the biggest uh, pieces that we've done over the last couple of weeks in terms of uh, traffic, in terms of volume. And it's a, it's a great piece that really could also have been titled um, Anatomy of a Fake Trade because he really goes through uh, bit by bit and kind of goes backwards up to the, the, the beginning of the genesis of I, I don't know if I don't know if irresponsible is the right word, but definitely someone who's playing fast and loose with with uh, with the title of a piece, and and also you know sometimes people just make outrageous claims or just are just uh, you know spout off about about which team is looking at at which player, and because there's so much interest, because a piece like this can can go viral if if you're uh, if you if you actually are the leading uh, or the first place to to catch wind of of a trade, then um, everybody's got just a, a a laser focus on on any bubblings uh, about something like uh, about some trade that might happen, and and that's uh and that's exactly what uh, what what Gomez uh, wrote about was a couple of uh, well one that he quoted. Uh, from the from the um, from the True Hoop site, and then another one that he pretty much tracked himself uh, from 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 a website that just isn't interested in 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 playing it close to the vest and is just out there uh, just essentially uh, bumming for hits. Yeah, that's that's true. You know what? It, this isn't just. Um relegated to the internet though newspapers do this too sometimes but uh one of the things that was interesting is that the original posting itself about the knicks and a, and a young fellow named del pearson wrote this mm -hmm. he, and he was honest about the whole thing he didn't say he had any sources he didn't hide behind anonymous sources all he did was say what he wanted to see happen for his favorite team and other people picked it up and that's where that's where the irresponsibility uh, really comes from, and that's uh, and, and that's when people glance at something, when people skim something, and suddenly just throw it up. And and that's I, I've seen a ton of this because you know I, I I look behind the sites, I see who's linking into us, I see where the hits are coming from, and I go back out to these posts sometimes, and it's obvious that the people who are it's obvious that sometimes, say that, sometimes the people who link in and, and describe the post have at best quickly skimmed the story. And that just does not give you a, a, a very good idea at all of what's really being said. So if you, if you see a provocative headline, if you skim a couple of sentences, then you could be off and running in the completely wrong direction. And that's where... And that's that's what happens. That's what really when people get in trouble because a, a quote unquote reputable source or someone who should be reputable will say like uh, will will jump out there and run with uh, a story exactly the way you describe, where somebody's just talking about what would be great, whether or not it fits under the trade ca under the uh, under the salary cap, whether it's a trade that only works one way, the other team there's no way the other team would go for it. Or, or whether it's uh, you know about about someone that's that's even on the trading block, um, and that's and and that's where a lot of this happens because everything's done at high speed. Everybody's blazing through stuff. Everybody's you know wanting to to, to try and accomplish so much, uh, and and without really carefully vetting this stuff, then you get you know these huge spikes. On stories and on 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 trade t uh, potential that has really no bearing on reality, and that's only a portion of it. That's only a slice of what Gomez went into on this post. Because another another uh, portion of it is is that people know that this kind of uh, this kind of thing bounce, you know, this kind of thing bounces public opinion around, and so you'll even have agents or representative of uh, either a team or a player go in and create fake trades sometimes just to get things moving. Absolutely. And now he gave a list, you know, the one thing about it, they kept cracking on this guy cause he only had 112 Twitter followers. 
that doesn't mean he wasn't right. <laughs> right. And, well, you know, that's and that was uh, and that was what the the Daily Thunder guys were doing. It was uh, one of the more provocative quotes from that from that piece is they kept on kind of mashing on him because he was uh, you know kind of a kind of a newbie, I guess. Yeah, we don't mean to pick on him, but then they kept picking on him. You know, it's one of those things. It is what it is, though. That's why I don't pay attention to that website. I go to welcometoloudcity.com for all my Thunder news, and you should too. But uh, here's some names that were in this article, and well, I can argue about some of them. But Adrian Wojnarowski, Mark Spears, Sam Amick, Mark Stein, Chris Broussard, Ken Berger, Darnell Mayberry. Howard Beck, or heck, even me. Well, no, I'm not going to go to you for any sources, dude. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. But uh, if there's NBA news to be known about, these guys know it. Now, I, I can tell you that I honestly think that sometimes that some of these guys also, you know, hide behind fake sources or hide in just to create a story and a headline as well. I know Chris Broussard has been called out on it publicly. In fact, that little project that I'm working on, for the mm. for the site, right? That was the impetus for the whole thing. Oh, for the first that... question, it was Chris Broussard talking about trading for Car- Carmelo Anthony for Blake Griffin, mm-hmm. and I stumbled across it because I visited Steve Perrin's blog, and Steve blew a gasket because about this very same issue. And you know what? The bottom line is this: anytime that you hear a trade rumor. Go to ESPN.com, and there's a thing for in the NBA. There's a thing that says trade machine. Put those names in there and see if it fits. That's the first thing you should do, and I don't care who it is that says these things. Do that first, and then and only then, if it fits, then maybe you can give it some credence. Otherwise, you know, I, I don't pay attention to it. I really you know, don't. You know, there's another, there's another alternative. And that's a, and that's the first thing that you should do. You could go to the trade machine. That's one of them. This, uh, another first thing you could do is sleep on it and wake up in the morning and see if it's buzzing even harder than it was when you first saw it. I mean, it's just it, the, none of the none of these people are GMs, right? That's the thing. <laughs> um, you can't make any of this stuff happen. You can cheer for a team, right? And you can go there and you can yell and you can su- support. You can you can do whatever. But I mean. It, as far as the trade is concerned, isn't there like no GMs out there listening to somebody, you know, rooting for a particular deal? <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm bur- bursting anybody's bubble. It's just not happening. So the other thing you could do is just flat out sleep on it. And and uh, these things these things build momentum. A, a lot of them do. With the Spurs, it doesn't. It, it, there is no momentum because everything happens behind the scenes. And by the time you've heard about it, it's either it's either been disproved. Uh, or, or that's the, that's the loudest it's ever going to be, or what you hear is that it's already been done. And that's, and that's why, uh, that's why this kind of thing is, is difficult to, to track as, as far as PTR is concerned, you know, w- with our website is that the, the Spurs play everything so quiet that, uh, that we kind of have a, a, a little rule that we go by and it's the, uh, it's the trade corollary, which, which essentially means if you ha- hear a, a trade rumor it's the only it's the only trade that's guaranteed not to happen because there's no way it would be in the press if the Spurs were actually going to do it. That's exactly right. The other thing too, um, when Mo Cheeks got fired on Sunday, mm-hmm. they found the players on the team found out on Twitter because yeah. no one knows they they keep these things so close to the vest. Some teams do, yeah. Some teams really do, and agents have agendas too, you know. So you have to be really careful. And that was the gist of this article. And you can find it at Pounding the Rock. It was really good. It was it was well written, and it was, uh, you know, without saying the things that I would say, because I would say some other things. <laughs> but uh, quite frankly, uh, honestly speaking, go to the sites at SB Nation because they're all vetted, <laughs> and, and don't go anywhere else. That's what I think. <laughs> That's what I think, Jr. Go there. That's where I go first and foremost. Before I, when I want to kind of clear up a rumor, except if it's a Spurs rumor, because none of you know either. So, <laughs> I mean, there's no point in asking you, but I go straight to the editors because I know most of them now. And I just, before I say anything stupid, usually, <laughs> and, and that's, it is what it is. But uh, I'll tell you something. Uh, this is a great topic, though. We can debate this all night, but we only have about 15 seconds. 
So right. I, I guess what we can say is the San Antonio Spurs will be continuing their rodeo, ro- rodeo road trip after the break, and we'll be talking about that more in depth next week. JR, thanks for being on the show, man. Great stuff. Enjoy it, Phil. Thanks a ton. Oh, you're welcome. That was J.R. Wilco, and you can find him at poundingtherock.com. Coming up next, Zeb Benbrook and I will be talking about LeBron James, Mount Rushmore, and a whole bunch of other things. And we'll be right back. You're listening to The Phil Nason Show. The Phil Nason Show will return. And it's the reason Al Gore invented the Internet. After these brief messages. Do you know your fantasy sports? Would you like to make money at it? DraftStreet.com and The Phil Nason Show would like to help you get started making money playing fantasy sports today. And we'll even give you the chance to get started making money today for free. On me. That's right. All you have to do is head on over to PhilNasons.com or visit the show notes for this show. Click the Draft Street image at the top of the page and start making money playing fantasy sports at DraftStreet.com today. If you like baseball, you should be checking out BaseballPodcasts.net. It's one of the best places you can go on the Internet to listen to independent baseball talk shows. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week on our radio player that can be heard around the world. So won't you tune in and give us a listen at BaseballPodcasts.net. You can also listen to the great Phil Nason show here. See you there at BaseballPodcasts.net. Are you looking to escape into lands full of fantasy, drama, and adventure? If you are, why not try Arthur K. Metter's books? Their journey begins, Journey to Freedom, The Night of the Dixie Wilds, On Top of the Rainbow, and Transcendence will get you there. K. Metter's books are available as an ebook or in paperback. And you can find her at authorkmetter.com. That's author, K-M-E-A-D-O-R.com. Riveting talk radio. Everybody get up. People cannot get away from the internet. Well, no. I think and it probably comes from porn as well. You yeah. Know what I mean, that's sure. got to be a big, strong big, thing. Strong oh, that's thing. gross. That's disgusting. And it freaks me out. <laughs> My cheeks are sealed. <laughs> we love talk radio. Bend over, baby. Do you see what I'm saying? WeirdTalkSuperstation.com. Better than sex. <laughs> I don't know how good sex is. We're going to do a lot of drinking. Talk radio. Bend over, baby. That was great. Brewtown Sports is your source for Brewers news and notes. Join Mr. Brewtown as he keeps you up to date on all the happenings of your Milwaukee Brewers and Major League Baseball. Follow the show on Facebook and Twitter, Brewtown Sports. Listen 24-7 at brewtownsports.podomatic.com. Hi, this is Phil Nasons from This Week in Tennis and The Phil Nasons Show. Max Sports Channels offers the best in sports talk radio, as well as great music 24 hours a day. It's my daily destination, and I hope it's yours. The sports talk begins each and every day at 3 p.m. and ends around 9 p.m. Special programming on the weekends, and in between all that, the hottest music on the internet. That's Max Sports Channels. Make it your daily destination. You're listening to AFR, the Armed Forces Radio Network. And now, back to the Phil Mason Show. <laughs> what a dope. What a maroon. <laughs> what is this? What's going on here? What are you people doing here? Welcome back to the Phil Mason Show. The Golden State Warriors are... Taking a well-deserved break. They won't play again till next week. And joining me to talk about that and more, please welcome from welcome to loudcity.com. Zeb Benbrook is in the house. Zeb, man, how you doing, man? What's up? I'm doing great. And uh, the ceiling's up right now, which is a good thing because I'm inside. 
Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. The ceiling here is too, but uh, you know, <laughs> I better not go there. Anyway, <laughs> you know what? I have to tell you that that was probably on Wednesday night, one of the more interesting basketball games that I've seen in a long time. The Miami Heat, LeBron James knocked them out at the end, but Golden State didn't stop fighting throughout that entire battle, and it was amazing. But before we get into that battle and the LeBron shot and what we think Golden State should do next, LeBron James is going to be interviewed on Monday. Um, I guess it is for Stephen Smith, and he's doing some kind of deal. Yeah, it's on NBA TV. And he was asked about Mount Rushmore and who he sees on a Mount Rushmore of the NBA. Now, I don't know. You saw this, right? Uh, I saw that he put himself on. I didn't see who else he put on it. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you who he put on there. He said right. you've got Michael Jordan, you got Larry Bird, and you've got Magic Johnson. And I would say the fourth, wow, this is so tough. The greatest players of all time that I'd like to see on Mount Rushmore, this is not fair. Oscar Robertson, those are my four. Now he goes even further to say this. I'm going to be one of the top four that's ever played this game for sure. And if they don't want me to have one of those top four spots, they'd better find another spot on that mountain. Somebody's got to get bumped. But that's not for me to decide. That's for the architects. Now, I think these, you know, LeBron James has never lacked for confidence. What do you think about that statement? Now, I guess the better question would be, if you had to put four guys on a Mount Rushmore of basketball, and for folks, for those of you who have never heard of Mount Rushmore, because we do have an international audience, that is a monument in South Dakota, and the presidents of four presidents, they're carved into the mountain there, of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. Okay, who do you have as a basketball Mount Rushmore, Zeb? <laughs> I think it's a really interesting question. I think LeBron got it wrong, honestly. I mean, he's not on my Mount Rushmore yet. He's not on anybody's Mount Rushmore. He's not even on his own yet. But I still think that he's, you know, looking at it from a modern perspective. He has still had Oscar Robertson in there, but he had no real criteria for what he was selecting. He was just kind of thinking of who was the best. You know, he's an expert because he's a player, but I don't agree with him. I think that when you set up around Rushmore, you got to put it into different eras because I think everybody had a different importance at different times. And it's kind of hard to look retrospectively at what people thought of the player at the time. So I'm going to split the NBA into kind of four different eras here. And when I'm looking at who I'm going to put on my route Rushmore, I look at how many titles they have and how they change the game. Those are the two most important criteria because if you don't have any titles, then you know you can't be the greatest because you got to be a team player. I mean, that's about basketball. It's not just about individual greatness. And then changing the game is about your individual greatness. And that's literally changing the rules of the game, changing the culture, changing the way that people play the game. And I think that's also really important when you make the Mount Rushmore. So my first era is uh, before the ABA began, which is just kind of like the beginnings of basketball. They were still, you know, roughing out the kinks. It wasn't very popular. It was playing small gymnasiums. And in that era, I think George Mikan is definitely the biggest. I mean, he has five titles. He won with the Minneapolis Lakers. He was a really great player, and he changed the game in so many ways. Two of the biggest ways, he widened the lane. It used to The paint painted area near the basket used to be half the size it is now. Uh, he widened it. That was a huge uh, difference for the game because it made, it, it made big men go further from the basket most of the time because of the three-second rule and all that. And he created goaltending. People used to be able to block shots on the way down to the rim, and that was part of Mikan's dominance, and they had to put a stop to that because if you could see Serge Ibaka in a game like that today, It'd be crazy. So you got to put George Mikan on there. And then you go to the next era, which is ABA versus NBA. I put that as 1967 through 1979, right before David Stern came in. And in that era, you got to go with Dr. J. I mean, he only won three titles, but he, he added dunking and athleticism to the game. There weren't that many athletic players. You know, there weren't people who could, you know, move the ball in the air, do dunk contests. I mean, he created the dunk contest. He created the whole culture. He popularized the ABA, NBA single-handedly. Now, two names of leaving out from those eras, Bill Russell, lots of titles, made people record blocks. He's definitely in there, but I don't think he's symbolic of a huge era or cultural change in terms of the game itself. Now, in terms of, cult in terms of culture, in terms of the U.S., in terms of how he enfranchised you know, uh, black people with the way he uh, 
he made the was he equal on the team. I think that was a big part of it too. So I think that he's definitely there. Oscar Robertson also there, average triple double, great great player. Anyway, moving on to the next era, the third guy I have on my Mount Rushmore, nineteen eighty through nineteen ninety. Uh, it's a Magic Magic versus Bird era. I have to go with Magic. I wasn't part of that whole Magic versus Bird debate, but he won more titles. And at the end of the day, he showed the big point guard, and he created more versatility in the NBA, which is something I think you see now. I mean, I think people were a lot more strictly defined by their position in the past, and now you've got a lot more moving and fluidity and uh, versatility among players. And I think that Magic Johnson was responsible for some of that. The last era I'll go into, Jordan and post-Jordan, 91 to 2004. Because I don't think you should have a guy on Mount Rushmore that's played more recently than ten years ago, just because you know you got to you got to have some time to get hindsight and think about it. And I think that this era kind of ends more around 02 or 03, just because you know that's when the post Jordan era ended and we moved into you know the the kind of more modern age. But uh, anyway, you got to go with Michael Jordan, uh, and he changed the game. You know he was athletic like Dr. J, but he made he changed a couple rules like the hand check rule. They kind of put that in after he came out which made it harder for him to score during his era, which I think kind of makes it more significant what he did. And they also put in the illegal offense rule, which means that you can't have more than three guys on the weak side or uh, on the weak side. Well, you have just one player on one side and have nobody with a chance to steal it because you got all the other players on the other side of the court. You can't do that anymore. You got to have two or less guys on the weak side perimeter. Otherwise they're going to, you know, take the ball away from you. And I think, and Michael Jordan, basically was the guy who created that rule because Bulls would just isolate him on one side, let him score every single time against the other team's defenders. So anyway, to sum up, George Mikan, Dr. J, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, those are my four on the big Mount Rushmore. You can definitely debate me. They're definitely big names that I've left out, but you're going to leave big names anyway, and I think that that's a nice way to define it. So uh, that's my Mount, my, Mount, my Mount Rushmore. Pretty hard to debate you, my friend, because you know what? You put your homework in, you did the work, and that's perfect. I'll tell you what, I like George Mike and Pick, but I didn't do all that with the uh, eras because there's going to be extra eras, and there still can only be four guys. Just like totally. there can only be four presidents up there on the mountain, there can only be four presidents or superstars of basketball, only four. And my picks would be Will Chamberlain. I'm going to put Oscar Robertson up there for the for just what you said. I mean, he was average a triple double. I don't care what anyone says about inferior competition or not. Doesn't matter. You get a triple double in the NBA. I don't care what level. You're doing pretty good. You do it over a whole season. Oh, Maron, pretty good. Okay, I got Bill Russell because of all the championships he won as a player and as a coach. And I have Michael Jordan. That's all. I don't have any of those others. Um, but here's the thing. This is what I was thinking, too, is LeBron says he's going to have to be up there. But here's the other thing. He's got somebody nipping at his, uh, the back of his sneakers. That would be a young fellow down in Oklahoma City named Kevin Durant. Now, Kevin Durant currently has a total point scores of after – this is his seventh season. So six and a half seasons, he's already scored 13,914. LeBron James, after seven seasons, scored 15,251 points. If I were LeBron James, I'd be worried about winning another championship because, you know, the one, two, three, oh, no, you didn't, LeBron, four, five, six mess. He needs to continue to win there. And then he should concern himself with picking another team to go jump to and go win some more championships somewhere else. Now, if... If there was a, a mountain for guys who couldn't win with a team, so they jumped and hooked up with their buddies, he would be all four of them. But he can't be. I would not put him up there. He, he's not even close. And I think Durant's going to catch him. That's what I think, Sam. <laughs> you know, I, I, th- I, think he's, I think he's pretty close. I think mean, Kevin Durant is a great all-around scorer. I mean, I think the main knock on his game is that his defense – could use a little bit of improvement just in terms of hustle. And right now he's not, he's, uh, you know, still improving his handles. He still gets a few too many turnovers a game sometimes. And, uh, you know, there, there's a few knocks on his game that LeBron doesn't have. And I think that he's not on LeBron's level just yet. I think that they're right about even right now because, you know, LeBron's in midseason coasting mode. Kevin Durant needs, has a chip on his shoulder because Russell Westbrook's gone. So you can't judge anything until the year's over. 
And I think that, you know, I think that it's going to be a really big race. I think it's kind of a magic bird like situation. They're not of the same generation, but they're definitely of a similar caliber. And there's no clear answer as to who the better player is yet, you know, and we're not going to be able to find that out or even ever solve it until the end. And I think that's, that's a great thing. I agree with you too, but I think Kevin Durant and, and, and I could be completely wrong and I'm not afraid to be because this is sports talk radio and we have opinions and sometimes we're, we don't get them right. But I think before it's all said and done, Zeb, Kevin Durant is going to wind up averaging a triple-double for an entire season. I know it's really? unheard of, but I do believe it. And I'm going to tell you why I believe this. Because that young fella has improved his court vision, especially this season. He's uh, finding the open people. He's making his teammates better, and he's the bene- and they're better for it. And he is the beneficiary of it because his assists are up. I mean, this is a kid, he's already, he already has 290 assists this season. Last year, he had 374. He's got 28 games to go. Oof. You know what I mean? And, and prior to that, he had 231, 214, 231, 205, 290, or 192. Not wow. only is he That's scoring strong. more, but he's passing the ball more, and he's rebounding more. And if that kid ever develops a back-to-the-basket post-up game, Forget about LeBron being on Mount Rushmore. I might have to move the big O. And I don't want to move the big O. But anyway, that was great stuff you just gave us, man. I really appreciate that. You did your homework, and I'm very happy about that. Now, back to this basketball game, because we've only got about three minutes left. (laughs) That was incredible. That fourth quarter, it was Steph Curry and LeBron James and get the hell out of the way, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's 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 great whenever you get to watch two great players go at that, go at it like that, in two different teams. I mean, uh, you know, Miami and Golden State is always going to be a close game, especially when Golden State doesn't have their centers in. I mean, they had Jermaine O'Neal and Andrew Bogut out for the game, so they kind of had to. They were kind of forced to run with Miami, so you knew it was going to be high scoring, lots of passing, lots of turnovers. And at the end of the day, I really thought that Golden State's turnovers came up with them. I mean, 13 is kind of low, but you had those demoralizing turnovers. You had those turnovers in the backcourt where the Heat just get an immediate point. You know, it's those points off turnovers that really kill them. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's two great players going up against each other, but you can't let LeBron get that last shot in single coverage. I mean, you just can't do it. You got you to gotta let him pass to somebody and give, you know, Maybe you let Ray Allen take the open shot. I would rather have Ray Allen take the open shot at his point career than letting LeBron take a shot in single coverage, you know, all alone with Harrison Barnes there. I mean, that's just not going to win you basketball games. I mean, I think that Mark Jackson did the right thing at the end of the game by scoring and then letting the Heat get the last possession because it's just going to happen sometimes. It's basketball. But you can't let LeBron go into single coverage. That's just senseless. You know, it's, he's, you know, every team, I mean, I watch the Thunder all the time. Every team that sees Kevin Durant, Coming to shoot the last shot always sends two guys at some point. I mean, it's just going to happen. So I think that was the biggest error by the Warriors last night. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, there was a bright spot, and and that is a couple of people, really. Draymond Green has been playing fantastic as a starter right now, and I think if they put him in more often as a starter and small when they go small ball with him and Lee side by side, I think they'll be okay. But Harrison Barnes is starting to play like I thought he could. And he had a pretty big night against Miami. So it's all good. I think, honestly, that the Golden State Warriors are at the A spot right now. I think they're going to be all right. Uh, they're starting to put it together. They, they need to get a little more effort down low with David Lee, though, because when Bogut's not there or when Bogut's out, it's, it's not a very good time for them. Yeah, they got to get a lot of they got to get a lot more defensive intensity in the post, and you know that just comes with Andrew Bogut and Jermaine O'Neal coming back, uh, and you know, and David Lee definitely needs help. I mean, there are just a couple plays where he's on a pick and roll and he's just running to the basket, but all the attention's on him because he's the only big running down there. So uh, you know, you can't blame too much, but you know, bravo to him for going to eight to 15, eight and fifteen while being basically the only big on the court, using his post up offense, doing some perfect pick and rolls. I mean, you know. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's definitely, you know, doing his best to step it up in his own way. There's a lot of, you know, he's got a lot of flaws in his game, but, you know, doing pretty well. Absolutely is. Great stuff today, Zeb. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Thanks for having me on as always.
Uh, my pleasure. That was Zeb Ben Brook. You can find him at welcometoloudcity.com. Coming up next, his boss is on. Will be on the line to talk to Oklahoma City Thunder and to give me another Kiwi test. And we'll be right back. You're listening to the Phil Nason Show. The Phil Nason Show will return. And it's the reason Al Gore invented the internet. After these brief messages. Hi, this is Phil Nasons from This Week in Tennis and the Phil Nason Show. Max Sports Channels offers the best in sports talk radio, as well as great music 24 hours a day. It's my daily destination, and I hope it's yours. The sports talk begins each and every day at 3 p.m. and ends around 9 p.m. Special programming on the weekends, and in between all that, the hottest music on the internet. That's Max Sports Channels. Make it your daily destination. Hi, this is Gary Mack of Mets Musings, and I hope you'll join me each and every week as I recap all of the comings and goings on in New York Mets baseball. I'll have guests on from all across Mets Nation giving their insights and analysis on the New York Mets. And you can follow me on Twitter at Mets Musings 1, as well as on Facebook. The group name is Mets Musings. So tune in weekly to the Mets Musings, available at MetsMusings.com, Stitcher.com, iTunes.com, iHeartRadio, and of course, BaseballTalkRadio.com, the home of great baseball talk shows. Riveting talk radio. Everybody get up. People cannot get away from the internet. Well, no. I think and it probably comes from porn as well. You yeah. Know what I mean, that's got to sure. be a big, big strong big, thing. Strong oh, that's thing. gross. That's disgusting. And it freaks me out. My cheeks are sealed. <laughs> we love talk radio. Bend over, baby. Do you see what I'm saying? WeirdTalkSuperstation.com Better than sex. <laughs> I don't know how good sex is. We're going to do a lot of drinking. Dog radio. Bend over, baby. That was great. Are you a fan of historical fiction? If you are, then why not try author Mary Ann Bernal's The Britain and the Dane series of historical fiction novels. You can purchase these novels from her website at www.maryannebernal.com. That's www.maryannebernal.com. Do you know your fantasy sports? Would you like to make money at it? DraftStreet.com and The Phil Nason Show would like to help you get started making money playing fantasy sports today. And we'll even give you the chance to get started making money today for free. On me. That's right. All you have to do is head on over to philmasons.com or visit the show notes for this show. Click the Draft Street image at the top of the page and start making money playing fantasy sports at draftstreet.com today. You're listening to AFR, the Armed Forces Radio Network. And now... Back to the Phil Nason Show. Now here it is, your moment of zen. Welcome back to the Phil Nason Show. The Oklahoma City Thunder are comfortably at the top of the Western Conference in the NBA. And joining me to talk about that and more, please welcome from welcome to loudcity.com, J.A. Sherman is in the house. J.A., how you doing, man? Welcome to the show. Hey, Phil. It's great to be back. Uh, the Thunder are doing really well. They are pulling away from the competition as we are entering the All-Star Weekend. So things are really good in Oklahoma City right now. Well, they should be. Now, we're going to be recording while they're playing the Los Angeles Lakers, but I guess that's okay. Yeah. The, the, can, can we chalk that up to a win? I mean, it, I, can, I, can I take the liberty to do that? <laughs> yeah, you can do that if you wish. Sure. Okay. But you All never right. know anymore. But still, yeah, I give you that win. All right. But, but now, still, now watch disaster strike. <laughs> more than likely. Yeah, that's how it usually works. 
But I, I got to say, the play of Derek Fisher and the play of Jeremy Lamb have been huge. They have, and and shockingly so. Uh, Jeremy Lamb is a second year guy, and he was really a wild card coming into the season. Uh, he was expected to be tabbed as as the key sixth man coming off the bench, and of course that puts him straight into the shadow of James Harden, who was the sixth man of the year with the Thunder before they traded him to Houston. So that was huge st- uh, shoes to fill. And, and for a while, we were wondering, does Lamb have what it takes? And what we learned over the course of the first half of the season is that not only does he have what it takes, but he's got a whole lot more than we anticipated. He's a really good player, very smart, good at running an offense or playing off the ball. And defensively, he's been surprising. And on the rebounding uh, uh, area, he's been very surprising. So there are a whole bunch of things that Lamb has really impressed us with. So he's on the younger end of the spectrum. But on the older end of the spectrum, we've got Derek Fisher, who's 39, going on 40. And he, uh, he's he been a part of the Thunder for the past three seasons, although the previous two years, he just was, he joined the team at the end of the year. And, and Thunder fans would frequently get frustrated with him because we felt like Scott Brooks was depending on him more than his play warranted. Well, this year he's been with the team for the full season and he just had probably his best month of play in maybe a decade. I don't know. I'd have to look back at basketball reference or something to see when Fisher had this good of a stretch. But he's shooting over 50 percent from the three point line. He's playing smart. He's providing good defense. He's been a major, major surprise for the Thunder bench. Yeah, he sure has. Father Time has stood still for him, but uh, he really did a number on uh, the Knicks, and mm-hmm. he did a number on the Timberwolves, and he's done a number on a couple of teams this season, but he's been hot from three, 55% in his last five games. That's incredible. Yeah. Absolutely, and it, yeah, it's not just the fact that he's shooting so well, it's the timing of his his shots. He's been hitting some really big shots in critical junctures of the game, and he's he's risen to the challenge very well. Well, this is what champions do. Yeah, let's hope so, yeah. And he, and he is. He's got five rings. Exactly, and he was an integral part in every one of those. So, I mean, you know, people poo-poo him a lot, but the bottom line is you hate to see him on the floor in the last minute of the game, and more importantly, you don't want him to shoot because for yeah. some reason that ball goes in. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been really good, and uh, and he's gotten better as the season has gone on. Uh, so even after the they lost Westbrook for the second time of the year, we we're worrying a little bit. Oh my gosh, Fisher's going to start getting twenty plus minutes a night, but his performance has scaled pretty well. And uh, and this is just my my amateur observation, but I feel like his shooting mechanics have improved as as the season has gone along as well, and I think that has contributed to his high shooting uh, percentage. Well, his legs are there. That's probably a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, Zeb was on before you, and we were talking about the Golden State Warriors, and we talked about LeBron James talking about being on Mount Rushmore. Mm-hmm. And I, I made a statement there, and I'm going to back I, I can back this up, uh, and I did in that segment. I don't have my notes in front of me now but because we did it much earlier in the evening, but I firmly believe that Kevin Durant is at some point in his career – Currently on the pace he's on now, if he stays with that, at some point in his career, he will average a triple-double. I, I think there's there's the possibility of it, definitely. But in order for that to happen, I think his team would have to get worse, honestly. I don't think they would be a contending team. Because if they're a contending team, that means they've got two or three other guys who are getting five or six assists a night, which takes away opportunities from him. And I think the, the assist category would be the biggest detriment to him getting a triple-double for the season. Okay, that makes sense. But you know what, for me, what I'm thinking is this kid has improved in every facet of his game. He's 25 years old. He's on a contending team now, and he's averaging, what, six assists a game, five assists a game? Yeah. I'm telling you, I have this funny feeling that this kid is going to be that fourth face on Mount Rushmore when it's all said and done. He's fantastic. Now, we had some people write in about this Kiwi test you give me. Yes, it was a tough test. It was a tough test, and they they wanted to see me make a fool out of myself even further. And, (laughs) of course, me being the sport that I am, I I said, why not? 
So do you have any Kiwi words for me? from? Because the folks in New Zealand love this. Oh, yeah, because they've got a whole vernacular that is as unique as they are. So, uh, yeah, they love this stuff. So let's, uh, let's start out with an easy word, all right? Let's, let's get you a little bit of momentum here, okay? So can you tell me what the word haka is, H-A-K-A, haka? Oh, my own haka. I'm trying to think what that could be, and, and, and that's a crazy word, haka. Yeah. It, it, it's not the stuff that you smoke. It, it's not. No, that. it's not. It's not hookah. It's not ha hookah. Haka would be. That would be what the all blacks do. That screaming yes. chant that they do. Yes, absolutely. It's it's the ceremonial opening war dance that that the uh, the Maori would do, and it's uh, and I would say to your listeners, if you've never seen it, even on on YouTube or something like that, you got to check it out. It's one of the most uh, thrilling and chilling pregame rituals that I've ever seen, and and I wish uh, the Americans had something similar. But we just don't. It's 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 so unique and so awesome to to watch them them do this chant before they play. All right, so you got that one. Excellent. How about that one out of one? That's how I started last week. One out of one. Uh, Everything all right. went to heck. All right, second one. Uh, okay, this um I think you can get this. What is a kiwi? burger a kiwi burger oh i know what that one is that's an easy one i used to eat those uh that's a hamburger yep with with egg yes and it was that red vegetable um starts with a b beets yes that's right bing 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 bing, bing 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 that's two out of two boys two out of two and apparently you can find these at mcdonald's so it's it's a pretty common thing i think uh right. but uh but our readers say that Stephen Adams probably ate a lot of those. When I he would was back at home. would, yeah, sure. Very healthy though. Yeah, definitely with the, with the beat and everything. Of course, gotta have the beats. All right. Uh oh, here okay, we go. For our, all right, for our third word. All right, let's let's go with this one. What is hiding? H i d i n g. Hiding. Oh, that's easy, man. We used to do. We they used to say that after we would win a softball game. It's somebody when you give somebody a great big beat down. That's right, like a gangs of New York righteous beating. There you go. Bing, bing, bing. Three out of three. How about three that, boys? Three out of three. And that uh, you you've been studying, man. I got to give you props. And, and Sherm did not give me the names of these words beforehand either. But I figured you were going to ask me hiding. I figured you yeah. would. I thought you were going to. That's a good to word to have. That that is a good word to have for Thunder fans. That's a good word to have for me because sometimes I say the wrong word when I talk about the beatdowns. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, we've got Thunder basketball, and after the break, and they'll have a week off before they entertain Miami at home. And, and but but before that. You know what? I got to ask, what about this rivalry with Portland? I think this is turning into something incredible. I do, too. And uh, and I think we have to. Now, I'm going to go into dangerous territory here because I'm going to have to invoke the Thunder's former team name. Uh, but I think it does stem back to when they were in Seattle. And so you've got a natural northwest rivalry between Portland and Seattle. And so there is some history there, even though both Thunder fans and uh, Seattle uh, residents would like the, there to be a, a dividing line between the two franchises. So I think there, there is some history there. And since then, I really feel like they've always matched up well against each other. And, and this even goes back to a couple of years ago when the Trailblazers, they would struggle. They, they would not make the playoffs. But I always felt like in the first half of the season, they always looked like contending teams. And I don't really know what happened. I don't follow them as closely as some other guys do. So I don't know how they would tail off at the end. But they always seem to play the Thunder really tough. And this season has been no different. They, they won the first two games of the regular season. Uh, one was with Westbrook. One was without Westbrook. And so it, it really felt like they were starting to get into the Thunder's heads a little bit. But then in game three, we had a, a Kevin Durant explosion where he just went nuts in the fourth quarter, and they got a good win there. And then this past win, the, just two nights ago, it was a three-point three uh, difference in, in the win. Uh, the Thunder really had to grind it out because they weren't playing that well. They still didn't have Russell Westbrook, and they had to figure out a way to do it without Kevin Durant playing a great fourth quarter. And so to me, it was every bit as meaningful as watching Durant go off because 
they had to figure out ways to manufacture points. They had to play great defense. They had several really good defensive sequences at the end, challenging them to the, the Blazers to tough shots. And they came out of it with a surprising win. And so I really feel like they, they continue to match up well. The Thunder got back to an even level at 2-2 two and two on the regular season. And I think that if they met in the playoffs, we would be in for an outstanding series. Yeah, that's just it, if you can meet in the playoffs. And that, that would be an interesting battle, there's no doubt. But I, I really like Portland. In fact, I'm trying to get them to come on next week so uh, we can hear from them what's up. But next week, when the season begins again, yes. and everything resumes, Miami on Thursday night at home. Yeah, that's right. Then the and, Clippers um, on the road, then Cleveland at home, then Memphis at home. So four tough basketball games within a week. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's probably going to be the toughest stretch of the remainder of the season. Uh, now that I believe we'll have 29 games remaining. And um, and I feel like I've seen enough of what the Thunder are about this season where there's really only a couple games left that I really want to see how they do. And one is going to be against the Heat, of course, the defending champions. Uh, the other is going to be uh, against the Clippers now that they have Chris Paul back, and they just seem to be exploding offensively and Blake Griffin going to another level. And then I want to see how they end up playing against um, the Pacers one more time to see how they, they contend with their defensive schemes. And so, so to see Miami uh, right after the All-Star break, it's going to be a, a premier matchup, and the expectation is that Russell Westbrook will be back for that game. And I don't know if he's going to be able to carry the full workload. I don't know anything because they've been really tight-lipped about it. But uh, he's been practicing. I think they've held off from, from full contact practice, but they've been testing him out, making sure he's ready to go. And certainly if, if he can go, that, I think that really gives the Thunder an advantage because the, the Heat have struggled uh, getting good uh, guard play out, out of their guards, especially against athletic teams like the Thunder. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and this ought to be a very good test to see what Miami's all about as well. Because they've yeah. been kind of coasting in third gear the entire season, and, and I'm not so sure they're a, they're going to be able to turn it up. And that's one thing that I've said a long, for a long time is I think that they've played so many games that they're just tired and they're just fed up. And, and it can happen. you know, It happens to the best teams and it happens to the worst. But the one I'm looking forward to seeing is the game with the Clippers. And if Russell yeah. Westbrook comes back, that'll be even better. Another test to see if the Thunder are going to – maintain and hold on and if russell westbrook can maintain and hold on those knee surgeries three in one year that's not good yeah yeah it's it's definitely going to be a big test and so i hope they really continue to monitor him closely to make sure that there's no additional swelling or anything like that and if there's even the possibility of it man just rest him up until the playoffs i, I think the thunder are going to be fine surprisingly um fine until the, until that arrives so uh, yeah, let's just get him healthy and, and make sure he's ready to go. Yeah, that's the most important thing right now. And and they're obviously, it's, they're playing as if they don't even miss him. And that's because Kevin Durant has assumed not only his own role, but the, my man Third Row's role as well as a facilitator. And that's why I'm telling you, I just got this funny feeling about this kid that he's going to do some special, special things. If it's not this season... And he's already doing some special things. I'm talking triple-double stuff for an entire season. Great stuff tonight, J.A. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. That was J.A. Sherman, and you can find him over at welcometoloudcity.com. And that's going to wrap it up for today's Phil Nason Show. I want to thank all my guests for making this an amazing NBA basketball day. On Monday, we'll be talking NBA hoops and fantasy hoops. Until then, y'all take care of yourselves, be good, and most importantly, Ladies and gentlemen, my mother thanks you, my father thanks you, my sister thanks you, and I thank you. You've just listened to a pre-recorded edition of The Phil Nason Show. If you'd like to contact me, you can do so at philnasons.com. If you'd like to advertise, you can do the same. Contact me at philnasons.com. Like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Thanks for listening and see you next time.